Mutation testing is one of the interesting ways we can actually test how well our test cases are exercising the code. Traditionally, if we think about exercising or measuring the effectiveness of our test cases, most common measurement is our code coverage. So you're looking at statement coverage or decision coverage, those types of things. Mutation testing takes us a little bit farther and says, well, what happens if our code changes? How many things would we be able to detect with our existing test case? How many things would not go undetected? These things that are undetectable with, or these changes that are undetectable in the code based upon our test cases, they are strongly related to the potential that there's actually defects in the code. So the better our test cases actually kill off these changes, which these changes are referred to as the mutants, the better off our test code is at actually exercising the code in such a way that we have confidence that it is properly tested. So in this example we're going to use a tool called pit test to look at some Java code and we're going to look at a couple different types of mutants as well as how they may manifest themselves and how we can deal with them in our source code and writing our test cases. So if we think about it to get our definitions right, a mutation basically is a change in the original source code. So if I had a plus operator in the code and I converted that to a minus operator, that is a mutation because there's exactly one small change made to the original code. Now that mutation may result in the test case failing that passed previously. If it is detected by the test case, basically the test case is said to kill that mutation. There's a couple other things we may have in our mutations. We may have what's called a stubborn mutant. A stubborn mutant is a mutation that is one that we really can't kill very easily. It lives in the code even though we inject it into the code. It's not one that we can kill with testing. An equivalent mutation is essentially a, a mutation that results in functionality that is still equivalent. These are also impossible to kill. Trying to determine whether a mutation is killable, whether it's an equivalent or whether it's a stubborn mutation, is one of the challenges of using mutation testing. So let's take a look at an example. What we're going to do here is bring up a program. So this program really does some very, very basic calculations in code. So I've got a method that adds two numbers. I've got a method that subtracts two numbers. I've got a method that multiplies two numbers, divides two numbers. Fix my comment that's got a misspelling in there. And this is the summation of those numbers. So basically from 0 to n. Determines whether a number is positive and compares two numbers as to whether they are equal to each other, greater than or less than. So these are the three operations that we have. And I've got some test cases that are going to exercise this code. So I have basically add, subtract, multiply, divide. What I want to start with is I'm going to essentially run these with a tool to get code coverage. So this is being run as a test ng suite, and I'm looking to see what my code coverage is. So when I run this, we find that in the original source code here, I have 100% coverage across all of my methods. So from this 100% code coverage, we might think that we have very good test cases. We're going to find here in just a moment that we don't necessarily have the best test cases. So what I want to do is to switch over to a tool called pit test. And I'm going to make this screen just a little bit larger in terms of font so we can see what's going on here. So I am in this directory and I've got a batch file here that has been set up called pit test test ng .bat. This batch file will actually go through and run pit test on my source code. Now I've got a batch file that I'm running it to kind of clean up some of the executions, making sure I have my class paths set right, those types of things. So I'm going to run this and see what the results are. So 
So it will run. Right now it is mutating the code, running the tests, routinely running the test by changing one thing in the code each time it runs the test and then rerunning the test cases. And so as it goes, what we see is we got some results here. Some were found, some were killed. Well, which ones were killed, which ones were found? Let's take a look at a report that came out on pit tests. So inside of my directory here, I can go into here and see the results that I've got. This is showing us the code and what ended up happening. So each line that is green says I was able to mutate it and killed off both of the mutation operators. So here what we did is we replaced the integer with subtraction and we returned the return with a value of 0 or 1. Those were both killed off. But here we see we've got a problem. Return A minus B. Replace integer subtraction with addition that survived. Well, let's take a look at the test case that I've got for this. So I'm going to switch back into Eclipse here. And the test case for subtraction that covered subtraction, oh, I'm seeing that 0 minus 0 gives us 0. What I'd like to do is come up with a better test case for that piece of code that will actually kill it. So what I'm going to do is essentially assert that, in this case, 5 minus 4 is equal to 1. Now if we change that to 5 plus 4, that should not be 1, that will kill off this particular mutant. So we should be able to kill this one. Now here we see again a case where our test case was not very good, but I did have code coverage. The multiply we killed off the mutations, divide we killed off the mutations. Here's an example where we've got a problem with the summation. So, changed conditional boundary, this survived. If I look at what that mutation means in terms of the actual representation, this changed conditional boundary here at line 69 means that this start was replaced with greater than or equal. Replacing that with greater than or equal to, if you think about what happens, it means this loop executes one extra time. However, the fact that it executes one extra time where we add a value of zero means there's no way of changing or detecting this code so that this problem doesn't occur. This, in this particular case, here's what we would call a stubborn mutant. There is a change in execution in that the loop is actually executed one extra time, but because of the way the test and the code is structured, we actually can't cause a test to detect that that is a problem. A stubborn mutant. Now if I go down a little bit here, we've got this compare method. So this compare method also has got some mutations being applied to it. And this first one here, what's happening is we're replacing 0 with 1 and it survived. Replacing 0 with 1, if we think about it, this is not really going to make any difference in our particular code. The reason I say that is that in every path afterwards we actually overwrite that. So this is initializing retval to be 0, but it doesn't actually impact the code. Here again we see an example of a stubborn mutant. I could refactor this code, and I will refactor this code here, to take that assignment and change the code a little bit so it would be detectable. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this line of code so that if a is equal to b, where they are the same, I don't reset the return value to be 0. I leave it alone. Now that mutation should be killable with the test cases we have. 
Here at line 97, I've got another example. This is an example of what we would call an equivalent mutation. So here, what we see at line 7 is we changed the conditional boundary and it survived. So what happened in this case is this conditional boundary right here was converted from greater than or equals to just greater than. But if you think about the way the program executes, if A is equal to B, it's going to take this path up above here. It's never going to be able to get to this line of code. Here, we see what's the equivalent of an equivalent mutation. The behavior of the program is identical. The execution of it is identical, whether or not this mutation occurred or not. This mutation cannot be killed in this example. Now, you're probably asking, what would be the right way to fix this? If we really wanted to do this, we would change this to just be a greater than. Now we don't have this case of greater than or equals to that is actually coverage-wise pulled off by this part of the conditional up top here. So I've changed these things. I've re-changed one of the pieces of test code here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rerun my test cases to prove to you again that I still have my 100% coverage. So my test cases have ran. In my calculator example, we can see that everything is still 100%. If I scroll down through the code here, we see that all of the lines of code, all of the statements are green, which means I've got that 100% coverage. Now if I switch here, I can rerun my pit test. And so my pit test is rerunning, now doing mutation testing on the code that we had before. And as it finishes here, what we're going to do is take a look at the results for the second run that we have here. And I can see that we now killed off the subtraction mutation right here by changing and adding that better test case. We've still got this problem here with this stubborn mutant that I described earlier. This mutation still exists here. Now the last one that we've got is this mutation here, return number greater than zero. So let's see what's happening here. Change conditional boundary and it survived. Now if you look at what we have in terms of the code here, what we're doing is we are actually asserting that a number, oops, want to go to the example code here, the number is greater than zero, which actually this should be greater than or equal to zero. Now right now, if I look at my test cases for is positive, we see that I'm testing two and negative two. 2 and negative 2, if you think about it, are not necessarily the best tests for many reasons. If you look at a boundary value analysis, we're not testing on the boundary. So if I want to make sure that I can kill this mutation test off, I need to change these tests and test better on the particular boundaries. So I'm going to assert here with these three sets of tests, 1, 0, and negative 1. 1 and 0 are positive, negative 1 is negative, so is positive will be false. Now with these test cases, if I again run them and obtain the coverage on them, I should not see any changes in my overall coverage, which I don't, these are all 100%. And I can go in my directory here, I can rerun my mutation tests, which I'm going to do right here. So those are running here, and I will get ready to browse as soon as that is done. So my results ran. Here we are. And we can see that now those mutations were all killed. So now I'm left with this mutation here which is an equivalent mutation because there's nothing I can do to test it that will make the behavior of the program change and I have this stubborn mutant that there is a change but there's nothing that I can easily detect from the outside that indicates there is a change. 
So at this point, you've seen an example of how to run mutation testing from a batch file, which the batch file basically sets up the paths and runs the pit mutation tool. You've seen how I can actually take a look and use mutation testing to assess and come up with better test cases. And you've seen how equivalent mutations, stubborn mutations, will manifest themselves in some simple algorithms. So that brings this video to a conclusion.